Well, I can tell you that I am pretty thrilled with how this morning's going so far. Um, many of you might not be aware of this. I actually, it, it literally is um, in my job description now. I actually have, um, as, as being the associate and the youth pastor here, and the technology coordinator. And so, um, honestly, if I can be vulnerable, could you pray for me right now where you're sitting? Because um, I'm a little frustrated. <laughs> and, uh, and so, when it comes to this sermon... We're, we're finishing out our, our series in 1 Corinthians this morning. Um, and, and when it comes to this sermon, I actually spent a large portion of this week trying to figure out what I even wanted to preach on. You know, I, I was tempted to, to go to the end of the book, 1 Corinthians 16. It kind of just made sense, you know, a bookend to the series. And um, in, in 1 Corinthians 16, there's discussion about um, giving and there's discussion about like personal requests and prayer requests and some some kind of final stuff and and I could have done a, a message on giving and and, and and perhaps time will tell I I should have um, but it dawned on me that we had not really given perhaps the most famous chapter in First Corinthians its due diligence and I'll mention this a couple of times Van. Um, a few weeks ago, did an excellent sermon on 1 Corinthians 12, and then kind of touched on 1 Corinthians 13, which is great. Uh, except that he, you know, his whole his whole thing was he was planted in 12, and he and he kind of he, he mentioned 13 at the end, which is which is great. But, but I think as a church, it w- it would do us good to understand this chapter because I think it, it is Paul finally getting to the Corinthians what it is that he wants them. To know and to understand. Now, I, 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 there's a, a few things from my life that I wish you guys could experience because, um, mostly because I think it would be funny um, for you to see me as a um, four year old on a probably Winnie the Pooh leash at Walmart. Um, but one of the things that I wish you could experience um, that not a lot of you have, some of you, is the Christian college culture because it's a wild thing especially in regards to love. Now, if you've gone to a Christian college or you have kids who went to a Christian college, you're familiar at all with a Christian college, you'll know that there is all sorts of uh, phrases and phraseology around the idea of romantic love. Uh, One of the things we say in Christian colleges is ring by spring. Uh, You'll get to the college and by spring you will be engaged. Another thing is usually taking like a section of your college's name and adding the word bridal in. So like I went to Ozark Christian College, used to be Ozark Bible College, and people called it Ozark Bridal College. And there, there were other things too, like, um, and this is horrible, and I, and I actually detest this, but they would say that women would go to these colleges to get an MRS degree, a Mrs. degree. See, there was this huge pressure in Christian colleges to get married, ring by spring. And so as a Christian college student, I went to... A lot, a lot of weddings. And many of them, most of them, included 1 Corinthians 13. Now that's not just common to Christian college weddings, it's common to a lot of Christian weddings, to include this passage, this passage that speaks so eloquently about love. Usually this passage is either uttered through the booming preacher voice or through, uh, through tears uh, as, and said meekly in vows. And th- this is in almost any Christian wedding. It's the quintessential passage on love. But, but, it ain't talking about romantic love. And I think we understand that. I'll dive more into this in a minute. The Bible, when it uses the word love, can mean like four different things, and so can we. But the, but the languages, especially, specifically the Greek language that the New Testament was written in, there, there are four words for love. We'll explain those in a minute. In English, we have one. Here, here, here's what I mean. We don't really understand, as 21st century Christians speaking the English language, the, the concept of love. In Greek, there are four words for love. Eros, storge, phileo, and agape, and they all mean different things. In English, we have one. And imagine how confusing it would be for the first readers of the New Testament to read 1 Corinthians 13 in English. Or to even come, for the first readers of the, of the New Testament to come to our world and hear us talk about love. Because we can say, I love tacos and I love my wife 
in two adjacent sentences and mean something completely different. We don't really know how to deal with love. I mean, and so before we dive into this chapter, we've got to talk about love really quick because I think we get this so wrong. In our culture, even as little children, we're conditioned to think that we know love. Whether it's through Disney movies or rom-coms, we watch these films or we read these books and become immersed in this, we become enraptured by this idea. I mean, who among us could say that as a kid they thought, man, I could be really content for my whole life just being single? I mean, you may have little boys who say, ew, icky, you know, cooties. But, but, but really, the dream you have and the dream your parents have for you and the dream society has for you is that you get married and you fall in love, right? And in our culture, and really almost every culture in the world around us, has made us desperate for this kind of love. We sacrifice time, money, and even ourselves. And we think that this is something that, that we think that something is desperately, horribly wrong with us if we don't have this kind of love. We must have romantic love. Our kids must grow up and find someone to love them. And hear me. I think for the most part, God created us to marry and be fruitful and multiply. God created within us a desire to have a spouse and be in a relationship. But we can't, again, we can't forget 1 Corinthians 7. I talked about it a few weeks ago. That Paul writes that it's better to be single. Why? Because Paul, listen to this. Because Paul, being in a culture that is obsessed with sexual and romantic love, the Corinthian city, obsessed with romantic and sexual love. They had a, 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 a idol temple to the goddess of love, and and there would be sexual sacrifices made within it. In this this temple, in this city that is obsessed with sexual and romantic love, much like our culture, Paul realizes that the cure to that obsession, that idolatry, is not to give into it. And even if we can separate romantic love and genuine godlike love, even if we think we have it figured out, uh, we compare it to a soldier's sacrifice or a father's hard work, or a mother's embrace, when we think we understand God's love and and we do our best to emulate it, we can still pause and really think about it and know we don't live up to it. We're not that good at it. We make a a kind of mess of it, don't we? And what what if we can't effectively love because we don't know what love actually is? That we don't have an understanding of true, genuine love And that understanding of true, genuine love for us, like the Corinthians, is exactly what we need. Not just because, like the Corinthians, we're out of control romantically, but because the Corinthians and us are the furthest thing from loving. In 1 Corinthians 1, we see that one of the core problems of the Corinthian church is disunity. In chapter 1, it says this, I appeal to you, this is uh, verse verse 1, sorry, verse 10 through 12, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, and another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. This disunity has seeped down into the very fabric of the Corinthian church. This disunity was rooted in selfish ambition. You see, these leaders, um, for the most part, seem okay, but their followers were claiming to follow these leaders for the express purpose of gaining clout, right? So, like, if I can claim I follow Paul, Paul, I mean, he, he, he's written a lot of letters, and he's made a lot of disciples, and he's, he's, he's the great missionary, and that's my guy, that's my mentor. Or, hey, I follow Cephas. Jesus said that, this, that he would be the rock, Peter would be the rock on which he builds his church. That's my mentor. Or, man, you guys are are a bunch of clowns. I'm so much better than you because I follow Jesus. Jesus alone. And it's this like claiming of leadership that leads to dissension in the church. It led to disunity. And we can't be blind to the fact that it is so similar to how we do church today. My church is the best church in town. I've got a gateway. Uh, We've got the most loving people. My church is the best church in town. It's got the best, I'm not necessarily talking about us at this point, but like, it's got the most revved up worship. Or my church gives the most. Or my church, my preacher, best preacher in town. My, and we claim 
we claim superiority without even realizing it. Because it's never been about Gateway Christian Church. But it's been about the church. Just like for the Corinthians, it's never been about the followers of Cephas or Paul or Apollos. It's always been about the church. And man, what would it look like in our community if we embraced this idea and we formed deep relationships with other churches as individuals and as a body? This town would be turned upside down. Van delivered an excellent sermon a few weeks ago on 1 Corinthians 12. And Paul felt like he needed to correct this disunity in the body uh, by talking about unity. And he reminds the Corinthians that the gifts of the Spirit are for building up the body of Christ, not for building up yourself. This is how he finishes out chapter 2. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have the gift of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now, eagerly desire the greater gifts. So we know that these gifts are for building up the body, for, again, unity. Paul is dealing with a disunified church, and he spends the whole letter talking about unity. And so we know no gift is more important in the church than any other. Listen to me on this. You need to believe this. The ability to preach a sermon is in no way more important, helpful, or better than the gift of service or the gift of hospitality. It's not. And I can see almost, I can see you guys almost roll your eyes at this. Like, yeah, right. It's true. Our experiences don't determine truth. The Bible does. And sometimes a warm place to stay, a meal, and some kind words do infinitely more than perhaps a polished message from a stage to win the heart of someone who needs Jesus. We need servants and people who are hospitable. The church needs every gift. And I mean, I, can I take a minute and say, we need your gifts? If you are a follower of Jesus, you have at least a gift that can be used to bless the church. And if you are not using your gift to bless the church, you are crippling yourself and potentially crippling the church. We need you. We don't... Listen, can I just... Can I just be vulnerable for a second as a minister? If the, if the growth and the thriving and the health of this church falls just on people with the gift of leadership or the gift with the ability to teach, it's going to crush us. It's going to crush us. This last year, 2020, the numbers of ministers who stepped out of ministry for the final time would shock you. It's staggering. And the reason for this is that the growth, health, vitality of the church going through a pandemic fell on the shoulders of leaders. And yes, we're called to leadership and we're called to carry burdens, but we're not called to do it alone and we need every gift for this church to thrive. And so many of us, I want to be gentle here, so many of us have never used our gift in the church. Because we're scared. We don't want to be embarrassed, or we think we'll, we'll mess something up. Or we... The Bible is more true than your feelings. And we need your gift. Like, leaders in this church don't all have the gift of evangelism, and some of you do. Leaders in this church... All of them don't have the gift of hospitality, and some of you do. The leadership of this church has, well, the gift of leadership, but for many of us, it's not much more than that. And every Christian on the planet has some sort of gift for the building up of the church, and church, we need it. We need you. See, but, but, but here's the point of today's message. The gifts, the abilities, the things that make us distinct as Christians aren't the main thing that the church needs. And it's why Paul ends chapter 12 with this. And yet, I will show you the most excellent way. And he launches into, then, what we truly need, starting in verse 1. He says this, If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, 
but do not have love, I gain nothing. Immediately we see that Paul is going over so much of what 1 Corinthians has been talking about. In chapter 14, he talks about speaking in tongues. He mentions that here. In chapter 12, he talks about the gift of prophecy. Again, he does that here. Throughout the book, he talks about faith and does here as well. In chapter 16, he talks about giving to the poor. And you guessed it, he he talks about it here. This is in some ways a summary of the book. But he wraps up that summary in this exposition on love. Essentially saying, if you listen to everything I've ever told you so far, but you don't have love, it's worthless. It doesn't matter. Just plain old doesn't matter. In this particular section of chapter 13, Paul is doing something rhetorically interesting here. He's doing something interesting. It says, throughout this book, Paul has been saying to the Corinthians, follow my example. Even in chapter 11, verse 1, he says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And he's using that theme here, but with a twist, right? He's like, if I speak in tongues, if I'm the... if I'm the first, this whole section is in the first person. Paul's referencing himself. If I speak in tongues, if I have the gift of prophecy, if I give all I have, if I, and Paul's getting at this, if I set the greatest example, but I don't have love, I don't matter. If I'm the biggest deal, but I'm missing love, it doesn't matter at all. See, Paul is saying this our only measuring stick is love. The only way we measure success as a church, success as a Christian, success as ministers, leaders, the only way we measure that success is by love. And here's here's where we need to define what Paul means by love. Paul is using the word for love in Greek that the Bible uses most of the time when talking about love. Agape. So to understand agape, we need to understand the other types of love. One type of love that the New Testament uses, or actually the New Testament never uses this, but is used in Greek, which is what the New Testament is written in, is eros. It's where we get the English word erotic. I'm sorry for some young ears. It is romantic love. It is love that is of uh, sexual nature. Uh, It is love between two people who, as we would normally put it, love each other very much. The second is phileo. It's where we get the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia. It is... Brotherly love. It is love between two good friends. Brotherly or sisterly love. The second is store gain. It's love between family, right? It's the love of obligation because you're related to someone. What do these three types of love have in common? Listen to this. It is a mutual symbiotic relationship. In other words, in these three types of love, both people get something out of it. In Eros, you get a romantic partner. And, and, and a lifelong friend. In phileo, you get a friend and someone to depend on. In storge, you get the safety and security of family relationships. And to get something out of these loves, listen, is not necessarily a bad thing. It's just what sets agape apart, what makes it distinct. Agape is centrally selfless love. It is love that gives and sacrifices expecting nothing in return. This is, put plainly, the love of God. This is, put plainly, the gospel. That Jesus came, died, and rose again to save us from sin, death, and hell. That God's love would send His Son, expecting nothing in return to redeem a broken and lost humanity. This is pure love. And Paul is saying here that if he is the greatest Christian, best gifts, best morals, best knowledge, but he doesn't have the self-sacrificing, die on a cross, bleed for humanity kind of love that Jesus has, then his whole work and life for God are meaningless. This last week, I started listening to a pretty interesting podcast. Um, it's called The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. And it's by Christianity Today. And if you're familiar at all with Mars Hill, if, if you're not familiar, it is a church, well, it was a church, out in Seattle of about 14,000 people led by a pastor named Mark Driscoll. And what's crazy is that this church, in a matter of four weeks, dissolved. Gone. 14,000 people no longer had their church home. And the reason for this is because Mark had a history of repeated abuse and scandal. Um, Essentially what happened was, um, without getting into too much detail or even gossip, was that there was a um, message board on his church's website and he, under a different name, would harass and, and, and abuse people who he thought weren't living up to gospel standards. And there were several other things. I mean, the podcast so far is six episodes, and there's going to be more. He talked disparagingly about women. He uh, cussed from the stage. 
He did all sorts of different things, and yet, because he was this fiery personality, because he had potential and gifts and abilities, they say this in the podcast, like elders and leaders, from the, we saw all of his potential and his gifts and abilities, and so we, we hope that he would mature into his role, that he would become better. And they, and they ignored this advice from Paul. If you have all the gifts and you have all the abilities, but you don't have love, you have nothing. And in a matter of weeks, the church had nothing. They dissolved all of their campuses, and their campuses became, became autonomous churches, and they closed down their main campus. And suddenly a church of 14,000 was gone seemingly overnight. That's what happens when love isn't the primary thing. This is what the kind of thing Paul is talking about here. All the ability in the world is not baptized and dripping in love is worthless. Because it is the self-sacrificial love of God that saves people. Not talented preachers or exciting music. Our only measuring stick for success in ministry is love. And we need love. So how do we get it? Where do we go to learn love like this? Let's continue in this chapter, verse 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Paul goes on to explain what love actually is. And I, I want to be careful here because I don't think Paul is talking philosophically. I think he's talking in a very grounded way. Paul isn't philosophically talking about this perfect ideal of love that is patient and kind and good. He's talking about a person that was patient and kind he didn't envy and didn't boast. He's talking about Jesus. I think what's going on in the background is this isn't an, a philosophical ideal. It is the ideal person. And one of the uses that is so common in the Christian world for this passage is to plug it, your name into it, usually in the context of premarital counseling. Uh, we say, plug your name into the word love here and ask yourself if it rings true, right? So we, we'd say, but you know, Ben is patient. Ben is kind. Ben doesn't envy. Ben doesn't boast. Ben isn't proud. And we're like, oh man, I don't live up to that. And we use this as like, we use this as like a, a spanking for ourselves. when it was never meant to be that. This was always supposed to be a standard that you couldn't live up to. And, and that's okay because someone did. And that person's name is Jesus. I think that's Paul's point here. You don't measure up. None of us do. Only Jesus is perfectly patient, kind, unenvious. Only Jesus measures up to this. And so our greatest example is Jesus' love. It has to be. Because He's the only one that fits this description. And that's not to say we don't strive to become more like Jesus. Oh boy, we should strive. What it is is to say this. We are not the point. Jesus is. Listen to me. You will never, ever love your kids as much as Jesus loves them. You will never in a million years love your spouse as much as Jesus loves your spouse. And listen to me. For those of you like me who struggle with pride, you will never love yourself as much as Jesus loves you. This is talking about Jesus. Because you are twisted and tainted by sin. Sin has warped your very definition of love so that it becomes love that does expect something in, in return. And listen to me. I love all you in the room. This is, I'm just, just as a general truth. This is true of, of even the purest of us. See, those of us who are, have a penchant for serving and loving others, we do it deep down because we want either recognition or we want to build relationships and safety nets and security with other people, right? So like if I serve other people, then when life gets tough for me, when the rubber hits the road, they're going to they're be there for me. We, 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 we do it with 
even subconscious expectations. And I'm not trying to beat you up here. I'm trying to free you from putting pressure on yourself to live up to a standard that you won't live up to this side of the resurrection. Jesus is enough. And oh boy, does Jesus love you. He modeled this through his some 30 odd years walking this earth. I just want to read a story. Luke 5. One day Jesus was teaching and the Pharisees and the teacher of law of the law were sitting there. And they had come to every village of Galilee from Judea and from Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. And when they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles in the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teacher of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your heart? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them and took what had been, he had been lying on and went home praising God. And everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. And they were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. This is the life of Jesus. This is just one example. There's a reason that when, when God himself was, became flesh and walked this earth, that he walked around healing people. That he walked around not in a rage, but with hope and love. This is the life of Jesus. Where religion and society expected something in return, Jesus gave and he healed and he sacrificed expecting nothing in return. And yes, Jesus wanted their hearts and he wants our hearts. But while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Like before we responded to the gospel, Jesus died. He sacrificed expecting nothing in return. And this is why. And this is why our only hope is God's love. Listen to this. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection is in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Can we just pause and separate this out and break this down? First, Paul starts out with love never fails. Paul is continuing like he has just been in this previous section, listing off the, faith, the traits of love, but this is the most important. It never fails. You will never do anything, think anything, hide anything that will keep Jesus from loving you. In other words, you can never out the grace of God. Love doesn't fail even when other things do, as Paul points out. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it's going to pass away. When will these things cease? This is often a passage used by people who are called, I'm going to use a big word here and explain it, cessationists. Right? It, it comes from this, this theological term of cessationalism, that, that the gifts, the abilities, the things of the Holy Spirit that we find in the New Testament, especially in the books of Acts, ceased at some point after the apostolic age, and now we are living in a different age where there, these gifts are not really present. Now here, 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 I don't think this passage can be used for that debate. Because I don't think that's what Paul's talking about. I think there are, if that is a debate that is, that is to be had. I, I'm not entirely sure that people right now are going to be in this room speaking in tongues in certain ways. And I, you know, I'm, but I don't think that that's what this passage is referring to. That's my point. I think it's talking about something different. It's, it, I don't think it's the main thrust of what Paul is getting at here. Paul is thinking, like in other parts of 1 Corinthians, about the end. The end of the age. The return of Jesus. This is when these things will become unnecessary. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. Because when Jesus returns, we won't need prophecy. We won't need to search out knowledge in the same way that we currently do. We'll still have to study God, I think. In fact, I think it's, that's going to be our eternity, knowing God. But we won't have to search out God. He'll be right in front of us, able to speak with us in Christ. In the return of Jesus, prophecy is unnecessary and knowledge is completed. Those things disappear. So what remains? Love. 
and eternity loving our Creator. So Paul, Paul continues, When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. As Paul reflects on the growth of this world into completeness in the return of the Messiah, he reflects on his own life. As he matured, he, the way he lived and the way he thought it changed too. So we will be with God's people as we mature into eternity. We will become a people not, marked not by what we know, but by who we love. So for now, we see only a reflection is in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. See, this may seem confusing. Mirrors in the ancient world aren't like the mirrors that we have now. Where it's perfectly polished and we can see a perfect reflection of ourselves. It was kind of foggy. And it was kind of a, a, a not a good reflection. And it was like, when we, when we search out in the Scriptures Jesus, it's like looking into this foggy mirror. We can't really see Him perfectly. We, we can get some ideas in the Scriptures, but, but when He returns, it's going to be like we're face-to-face with Him. Like we can actually talk with Him. And we will know Him fully. And then, and this is important, we will be fully known. This is the great pursuit of every human being. To be known and seen. And will be known and seen by Jesus. And he finishes, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Paul talks about these in his writings uh, constantly. Ephesians 2, 8, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves as the gift of God. Paul talking about faith. Romans 12, 12, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Paul talking about hope. And Paul talks about faith, and he talks about hope, but Man, in this chapter, he just hits on love. This stuff is all over Paul's writings and teachings, but he recognizes that the greatest of these is love. And here's the thing. Here's where we get at it. Okay, close the books, close, take off our thinking caps, and talk about how we actually live. We have to get this right. we got to get this right. Jesus is our only hope because he is the one who truly loves us. This, I'm sorry, I love you guys. This is not talking about the, the love that you had for each other at your wedding. This is not talking about the ideal of love. This is talking about the love of the infinite God of the universe who had his children spit in his face, rebel against him, say, get out of here, old man, we don't want you. Like the prodigal son looking at his father saying, I want my inheritance, I wish you were dead, give it to me now. And running away. That was us. And God, like the Father in that story, looks at us and says, I still love them very much. And I want them to come home. That is the point of 1 Corinthians 13. And and if we adopt that definition of love and we plug it into our hearts, that is the attitude we should have towards other people. Other churches. Other Christians. The people who aren't Christians yet. The people who politically believe differently than we do. Eye rolling should not be the default of the Christian heart towards the world. Love should be. And we are failing at this church. We are angry and dismissive towards the world. Because we have placed our hope and our trust in systems and politics rather than in God. And we're failing them. We're failing them because the main problem isn't that they're politically different than us. Their main problem is that they don't know Christ. And they need to know Him. And know Him fully. Truth's going to have its day. I really don't believe in this scale of truth and grace that we talk about so much. We're like some of us, we're more, we, we scale towards grace. And we kind of, we let things slide. And then some of us, we scale towards truth and we're a little bit harsher with other people. I don't believe in that scale. I believe that we should always speak the truth clearly, uncompromisingly about the Scriptures. And in doing so, we should always default to love. You see, we talk about God and we talk about how, well, God's not only love, God's holy. God's all... Your primary calling as a Christian is to be loving. I don't know about you, I can be a jerk sometimes. I really can. I can take this thing and I can debate you into the dirt with it. I mean, I'm not trying to be prideful. I, just, I went to school for the, I know the Bible. And man, some of you guys I have conversations with you and I leave it and I feel bad because I've just beaten you into the dirt with it. I, my, my concern has been more that you are right because I am right rather than you know that I love you. And, and I hate that about myself. 
Because the one who wrote this book isn't like that. The one being in the universe who knows this book perfectly, who knows God perfectly, responded to people with tenderness, love, and compassion when he walked this earth. Well, he called Pharisees snakes and he flipped temple tables. Yeah, okay. Okay, but it never says that he was hateful or angry in those moments. Yes, it never says that he was angry when he flipped temple tables. And if those are the stories that, listen, I love you, but if those are the stories that you cling to when you want to be like Jesus, I seriously worry about you. Because the text never says he acted with hatred or even anger. I mean, you can go and look for yourselves. Jesus fought injustice. He hates sin that destroys family and communities. But Jesus loved even the Pharisees. And even though he fought for them to see the truth, he said hard things to them because they needed to hear it. He also met with one of their leaders in the middle of the night and had a tender conversation. And that man helped bury Jesus. Jesus always preaches the truth, but he always defaults to grace. And this is what the Corinthian church didn't understand. They knew the scriptures, but they used them for advancement. They knew how to do church, but failed to include the poorer among them. They knew what God wanted them to become, and they ignored it. And so do we. We should not be known first for our politics, or our arguing, or our pride. We should be known first for our love. In our culture, we are not. What would happen if we set ourselves to actually loving like Jesus, sacrificially, and without expecting reward? Maybe the things we've been fighting for with our politics, with our arguing, with our pride, would actually fall into place. Because, listen, that is how you win hearts and minds. You love like Jesus did. And it starts, church, with realizing you are deeply and passionately loved by God. Jesus loves you so much. And it starts with that. We act out. We are angry. We mess this up because we truly don't believe. We don't truly believe in the love of God. It's a distorted view. If you understood, if you were given just a second to glimpse how much God loves you, the way you talk about and treat your neighbors would change immediately. God loves you uncompromisingly and wants you to do the same to others. Maybe this is the first time you're really understanding or, or, or that the Spirit is working on you in such a way that you are really feeling, God loves me. And I need to make a decision to surrender everything to Him. If that is the case right now, I'm going to be over here during this last song. Come pray with me. There's not going to be words on the screen. You've got nothing else to do. Maybe, maybe you've struggled for years to be loving towards other people and you've defaulted to being right rather than being loving. Because you can be right and you can be loving. And you want to pray about it and you want to work through it and repent of it. Let's, come, let's talk. Because I'm right there with you. Let's pray together. Maybe you just need prayer. Maybe something's going on in your life and something I said that really has nothing to do with the main point of this message is stirred something up in your heart and you just need prayer. Please, I'll be right here by this door. We can sneak out and come pray with me. All right now, church, let's pray and let's ask God to help us to do better. God, we, we want to be known by our love. And God, we aren't. And maybe this isn't only our fault, but it is partially. God, help us to be so radically loving that people can't help but, but recognize it. Help our love to be so radical that it opens doors for us to have actual gospel conversations and bring people into the kingdom. God, help us to love like you, uncompromisingly. Help us to love with the type of love that would lay down our lives before people even respond. We want to love like you, Lord Jesus. And we need your help to do it. Mold and shape us and challenge us today. It is in your precious name we pray. Amen.